All right, welcome back. We're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through 2 Peter. Last time we got through verse 1. Woohoo! We're really going fast, aren't we? Um, make sure you remember that I did one called Introduction. So if you haven't seen the introduction, make sure you go to thecloudchurch.org and click on the top where it says verse by verse. And then go down to First and Second Peter and make sure you watch uh, Second Peter introduction. Then last week was our second in our verse by verse Bible study. And like I said, we only got through verse 1. And we're not even quite through verse 1 all the way. So we're going to have to go back a little bit to verse 1 also today. And then we'll continue from there. So this is actually the third in our series of Second Peter. Now... Last time we looked at a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, and uh, I kind of just wanted to, to show you who uh, Peter was. And uh, let me close this here, I forgot to close this. And I tried to give you a little bit of an example of who Peter was. And um, we looked at how Peter always seemed to be opening his mouth, inserting his foot, saying things he shouldn't, doing things he shouldn't. But God still used him. And I think as we're reading through Second Peter, this is why he's so much on... Uh, make sure you know. Make sure you don't forget. Make sure that uh, we remember. Let's grow and not be the way we were before. Let's grow as Christians and uh, learn some things. Learn from our mistakes. That's what my dad always told me, and I always thought it was so funny. My dad said, son, don't ever make a mistake. And I'm like, dad, that's impossible. Everybody makes mistakes. And my dad said, well, you don't have to. <laughs> and I'll just never forget how funny that was. My dad always said, well, you don't have to make a mistake. And I said, well, dad, how do I keep from making a mistake? Sometimes we do in our lives make mistakes. And my dad says, learn from others. Watch other people, how they live, what they do. Learn from that. And learn from their mistakes so you don't have to make them yourself. That was some of the greatest advice I ever got from my father. So today we're going to start again in verse 1, and hopefully I'll get a little farther this time. Um, but uh, we ended last time there in verse 1 where it was talking about precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. And uh, that's a good lesson there, how um, it's through the righteousness of God, Jesus Christ being righteous or just, He dying for the unjust, well, that's how we're saved and how we get imputed righteousness. So it's all through what Jesus did. And I thank God for the cross. I thank God for Jesus dying on it. And I thank God for what he did and how we're saved through what he's done. It's not what we do that saves us. It's when we trust solely in what Jesus did for us. Amen? It's not what I did or do that gets me to heaven. It's what Jesus did for me. So it's the cross, and it's through the death on the cross. How did he die, though? Not just that he died, it's how he died. It's through the blood. And so we looked at that last time, and I went real deep and in detail about the importance of the blood of Jesus, because it's all about that shed blood on the cross of Calvary. But today, I want to go back to verse 1, and I want you to see these, these words. Notice how it says, To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God... That, that's one phrase, but part of that phrase is where it begins, of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So notice how it's worded here, and how it says, of God, it says, of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And when you look at that, I want to pay careful attention to this. Again, remember that 2 Peter is full of doctrine. And it is so easy to just read through the Bible and read over things that if you went back and read and just thought about and just mulled over a little bit, just looked and goes, hmm, you get something out of it. That's why every word of God is so important. The Bible says every word of God is pure. Notice what it says. It says, of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So it says, of God and of the Savior Jesus Christ. All right, when we look at that, well, we who are saved and we believe in what we call the Trinity or the Godhead, we go, yeah, yeah, God is Jesus Christ. So whenever we see a passage that says God and Jesus Christ, we don't think two gods. But there are some people out there, they'll read something like that and they'll go, of God and of our Savior Jesus. Why, that's two different gods if you say Jesus is God. And you know who does that a lot? Your um, uh, Jehovah Witnesses. And Jehovah Witnesses are a cult or a sect in this world, of people that, instead of reading their Bibles, every month they read the Watchtower 
a magazine. What is it called? The Watchtower, I think it's what it's called. And they're called the Watchtower Society. In Spanish, it's La Atalaya, the, 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 the big tower. And um, that is a denomination that does not believe in the Trinity or the Godhead. They do not believe that God is one God in three. And he's three and one and one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. They don't believe that. They believe that there's only one God, and his name is Jehovah. Well, if you look carefully at things like this, you can't help but see that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Because there is one God, not three. But I have dealt with many of those in Honduras and other Spanish-speaking countries as well as here in America. And all they want to do is argue over the doctrine of the Trinity and say, Oh, you believe in three gods. Ha, 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 you're, you're this, you're that. Oh, they make fun of you and mock you and make, they, they laugh at you. And I can't help but just go, um, No, I don't believe in three gods. You're trying to put into my mouth what I believe. I don't believe three gods. I believe in one God in three. And that one God consists of three. And he made me like himself in his image, now I'm not God, but God said I'm made in his image, and so I am one person, but I consist of three. I'm a triune being. And I don't know if they just don't want to study it out for themselves or what, but oftentimes they'll go by what their little magazine says rather than what the Bible says. So to, what I thought we'd do today is we start out, we've got to finish up the end of verse 1, and we need to get into this doctrine because it's so important. I want you to see so you won't fall into a false denomination or a false uh, religious sect or a cult that is like those, the, the Jehovah Witnesses. And they have been banned in certain countries because they, um, they don't believe in a lot of things that um, the government says and they, they do a lot of uh, things that are, are strange that has even led to the death of certain people. Like uh, they don't believe in blood transfusions and, and so there have been people within that denomination they didn't allow blood transfusion and a person died. And so it's sad. So I don't want to be a member of a cult. I want to go by the Bible, not by what men say the Bible says. I want to go by what does the Bible itself say. And that's what cults do. Cults, a man stands in the way of the Bible and says, no, you can't read the Bible. You have to come to me, and I'll tell you what it means. But that's not how it is. So look here at what he says. He says, precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And a cult member who doesn't believe in the Trinity will look at that and say, well, that's two gods. So you claim to be a Bible believer and believe in a, in a Godhead consisting of three. Well, there's two, and they're both different. So you have two different gods. Well, let me show you the Trinity. Now, let me also say this. The doctrine of the Trinity is not a man-made doctrine. All right, there, there are people out there today coming along saying, the Trinity is a man-made doctrine, and it's made up, and it's not in the Bible. I'm going to show you here in a second that it is in the Bible. Okay? And I'm going to show you all the verses. But the Bible uses the term Godhead. So the word Trinity is not in the Bible. I'll be the first to admit that. Okay? So where does the word Trinity come from? Well, some people on internet, on YouTube, will go around and say, well, the word Trinity, that comes from the Catholic Church. And, then, and, and the Catholic Church started that word. That is a lie. And the facts do not prove that. Yes, the Trinity is something taught by Catholicism, and yes, Catholics believe in the Trinity as well as other Christians. But the word Trinity, and I looked it up, comes from a Greek word, I forget what it is, trios or something, I forget. And it comes, and from what I read, was it 100 or 200 years after Jesus, a, a Christian man termed that word Trinity? Well, the Catholic Church didn't start until 325 A.D., so how can it be a Catholic, made-up Catholic doctrine if it came into being by true Christians before the Catholic Church existed? <laughs> There's people on YouTube that attack the Trinity doctrine. And they say, it's a Catholic. It's made up by Catholics. And if you're a true Christian and you're not a Catholic, you're a true Bible believer, then you can't believe in the Trinity because the Catholics started the Trinity. And I look at that and go, okay, you really believe that? Well, well when do you believe the Catholic Church started? 325 A.D. <laughs> I go, but... That word was around before. So how do you say it's a made-up Catholic doctrine when the Catholic Church, according to you, didn't start till 300-something years after Jesus, and yet this word was coined by someone who was a Christian before the... the I, I don't know if their mind works or what, but they're saying things that 
do not compute. You know, like the old computer, does not compute, does not compute, does not compute, you know? That does not compute. You can't have something be made by somebody who wasn't around yet, okay? So why were there early Christians 100, 200 years after Jesus believing in this and using a term that eventually became the term Trinity? What were they talking about? Why did they believe in one God in three? Because that's what the Bible teaches. So let's get into this quickly. I have a lot I want to get to, but first let's go to Titus 2.13. Let's go to Paul first. Uh, what I want to do is we go through Peter, and I always like to go and show you what Peter says, then I want to show you Paul saying the same thing. And so hopefully you've caught on to that as we've been going through our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, and how often I'll show you what Peter says, and I say, now look how Paul says the same thing. And again, we can take Peter for us today because it lines up with Paul in most of the places. Now Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So notice how he says here, of our great God, of our great God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he says almost the same thing, he just puts in great. So great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now some people say, so what that means is there's God, Jehovah, and there's Jesus. But Jesus isn't God, only Jehovah is. So they only believe in one God, they say that one God is Jehovah. But they won't say that Jesus is God. Is Jesus God? Yes, he is. And we're going to see that in a minute. And that doesn't make two gods. That makes one God who consists of three. Not one. Three. But not three separate gods. One God. Okay? you got to get that. And as we go through these scriptures, you'll clearly get that. So some say that this makes two different gods. But let's look at that. Let's go to Isaiah 43. Okay? Isaiah chapter 43. So these people say there's only one God in the Old Testament, and his name is Jehovah. And so that's why they call themselves Jehovah Witnesses. They say in the Old Testament, God was called Jehovah. And so they say, only Jehovah is the true God. And you say, yeah, but Jesus, they say, shut up, we don't want to hear about Jesus. And you go, oh, so you guys aren't in favor of Jesus. No. And so they don't believe Jesus is God. They believe only Jehovah is God. All right? But the Bible teaches that Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is one with Jehovah. It's one God, not two different gods. And I'm going to show that. I'm going to prove that to you through this scriptures today. So Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 11, look what the Bible says. Isaiah 43, 11, in the Old Testament, well, let me read this first. Let me read 44, 6. Here's a good one. 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord the king of Israel. They say, that's Jehovah, that's Jehovah. Oh, okay. I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Well, you go to the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end, I am the first and the last. So who is Jesus? He's God. <laughs> Only Jesus could say that if Jesus was God. So Jesus and Jehovah must be one and the same. So the same Lord of the New Testament is the same Lord of the Old Testament. Because it's the same God. It's not two different gods. It's not three different gods. It's one God. Okay? Let's go to uh, verse... Um, oh, let's see. What did I say? I said 43. I actually read 44. Excuse me. 44, 6. But it was too good not to read. All right. 43, 11. And, and actually, let's start at verse 10. You're my witnesses. Yeah. All right. The Jehovah Witnesses say, we're Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses of Jehovah. Okay. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. That's verse 10 and 11. So, Jehovah just said he is Lord, and he said there's no Savior besides me. So he said, I am the Savior. Well, all throughout the New Testament, what is Jesus Christ called? Jesus is our Savior. But Jehovah said there's no other Savior. I'm the only Savior. So the only way that Jesus Christ could be the Savior is if Jesus Christ is Jehovah. So it's the same God of the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament, and Jesus is God. But you don't believe that if you're a Jehovah Witness. And guess what? If you're a Jehovah Witness, then you are wrong. I hate to say it, but you are a cult. You are a religious sect that is not rightly dividing the truth and not saying what the Bible says. And I want to see you get it right because your eternal soul depends on this. And many Jehovah Witnesses, they only go by the Old Testament. They won't go by the New, and they won't trust in the blood of Jesus for salvation. 
So they're lost. And that's a sad thing. Um, 45, 21, I've got some friends from uh, Scotland that were ex-Jehovah Witnesses. And they saw the truth and they got out. And they've even written books about why I'm no longer a Jehovah Witness. If you guys are watching, hey, I love you guys. Praying for you guys. They actually came and visited us one time. And uh, boy, if we ever get to travel again without the vaccine, I'd love to go visit them in Scotland sometime. That would be amazing. But uh, look at uh, Isaiah 45, 21. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 21. This is Jehovah of the Old Testament speaking. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. So Jehovah says, I'm the only God and I'm the Savior. Jesus shows up and he says, oh, by the way, I'm the Lord and Savior. But Jehovah says, no, I'm the Lord. So either Jesus is a liar, and he's pretending to be something he's not, or Jesus is one with Jehovah. Okay, does that make sense to you? It makes perfect sense to me. Let's go over here to 49, 26. Isaiah 49, 26. So I see one God sort of manifesting himself in three different ways, three different persons in the Bible. And one of those is the Father, one is the Son. So the Bible teaches a triune God, a trinity, a Godhead consisting of three, but it's only one God. Uh, Isaiah 49, 26, look at this. This is very revealing. 49, 26 says, And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, okay, Jehovah the Old Testament, am Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So the, the Old Testament Lord, Jehovah, the Savior, says, by the way, I am the Redeemer. Uh, who is Jesus? Well, if you read your Bible, it says Jesus is the Redeemer. Because he redeems us from our sins. So Jesus is the Savior and the Redeemer. So when you're reading the New Testament and you're reading all about Jesus, you're reading all about God. You're reading about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same Lord as the Old Testament. It's, it's God manifest in the flesh. It's incredible. Now, the only way it works is if he's in three. But yet he's one God who can manifest in three ways. But he's not three gods. He's one God. That's the only conclusion you can come to. Uh, we looked at 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says, knowing that you, uh, how you're redeemed through the blood of Christ as a lamb, without blemish, without spot. So Christ is the Redeemer. Okay? That's in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. So let's look at some verses real quick. There's a lot that I have to show you here. But is Jesus Christ God? Go to Matthew 1, 23. Matthew 1, 23. Many of your Jehovah Witnesses have been indoctrinated falsely by a cult. And please go to the YouTube and look up my um, video on YouTube entitled Why I Am Not a Jehovah Witness because I did a very exhaustive study on that cult and I found it very satanic in na nature. The man who started that cult uh, did not know his Bible, probably was not even saved, didn't even believe in hell. And to this day, many of the uh, cult of the Jehovah Witness say there's no such thing as hell. And yet, Jesus preached more on hell in the Bible than anybody else in the Bible. He spoke more about hell. There is a place called hell, and that's where you go if you're not saved. And so it's a very awful thing to go around preaching there's no such thing as hell. And it's a very sad thing. So you have to be careful of cults. So they say, oh, Jesus isn't God. If you've ever talked to a Jehovah Witness, ask them, is Jesus Christ God? You won't get a straight answer because they don't believe that Jesus is God. But all you have to do is read the Bible. Matthew 1.23, what does the Bible say? Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So the name of Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so these New Testament Christians are saying, Jesus our Lord, Jesus our Lord. What are they saying? He's our God. So when you go look at that passage, it says of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It's not saying of God, Jehovah the Old Testament, and of this other guy, Jesus in the New. It's saying of God and our Savior Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is our God. The and is and Savior. He's God and Savior. And it's Jesus who is the God and Savior. 
is not two different gods like they try to teach. Do you, do you, do you get that? Let's go, to, let's go to another one. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, which, by the way, has changed in new versions of the Bible. In fact, the Jehovah Witnesses have a very, very, very corrupt version of the Bible that was translated by very deceitful people. And you look at and, and you'll see that. By, you'll even see that by the testimony of that video that I did. And there's another video out there by Jeremiah Films, and I forget the name of it, but it's very good. I think it's called the Watchtower Society or something. And they do a great job of showing the truth about that false denomination. But in 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, new versions say He was manifest in the flesh. That's not what all the other texts of the Bible say. They say Theos, God. And you can see the one manuscript that says He. And, and the word in, is theos, is like this in, in the Greek, and he is like this. Okay, so that's the word he in Greek, that's the word God in, in the Greek text. Now, the one Greek text that says he, you can tell it looks like there was some sort of a line there, and someone kind of went, and, and kind of erased it. But you can still see that it was once there. So you have all these Bible texts, and every single one says God was manifest in the flesh. And then one says He was manifest in the flesh. And you clearly look at it and you tell someone erased the line that said God. So it was there at one time. So every Bible Greek text says God was manifest in the flesh. And that's what the Bible should say. If you have a version of the Bible that says He instead of God, you have a version of the Bible that someone very deceitfully and unscholarly and un, not even honestly translated. They were dishonest in putting He instead of God. Because the majority of every single text said God was manifest in the flesh. But they chose, well, we'll take this manuscript that says something different. <laughs> That's not how it worked. You're supposed to go with the majority of texts. What the majority of them say, not what one says that's been erased. It's just so deceitful, so sad. It definitely is an attack by the devil on the deity of Christ. So this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible in which it says God is manifest in the flesh. Who is Jesus Christ? God manifest in the flesh. Now let's run over here to 1 John chapter 5 in verse 20. Let me show you who Jesus Christ is. 1 John 5, 20. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Notice what that just said. We are in Jesus, the Son, and this, who's this? Jesus is the true God. So Jesus Christ is called the true God even though he's called the Son. So he can be both the Son of God and God at the same time according to the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ is God. He's Emmanuel, God with us. So when I look at Jesus, I see Jesus is God. But people say, well, I don't understand that. It doesn't matter if you understand it or not. It's true. Jesus is God. So let's go over to John chapter 10 and let's let Jesus explain it to us. People say, I just don't see how he can be a Son and a Father at the same time and still be God. It's two different things. No, it's one God, but in two different manifestations or two different persons. Let's go to John 10 and verse 30. Jesus Christ says in John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. So the Father is Jehovah. So Jehovah is the Father. And somehow God, remember he's three in one, He's able to separate himself into three. Somehow, God came down to be born of a virgin. And he called himself the Son. But yet, he's still God. Because he's one of the three, but those three are one. And they're not three separate ones. Let me show you John 10.33. Uh, you say, well, that, 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 there, there are all these arguments that people have against just believing what the Bible says. And it's so sad. John 10.33 Jesus is speaking, and he says, The Jews answered him, saying, For the good work we have stoned thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. The Jew says, uh, You, Mr. Jesus fella, you're saying you're God? They understood that when a person says, I'm the Son of God, that person is saying, I'm God. And the, so they're saying, You say you're God, Jesus. 
uh, we can't swallow that. We can't accept that. Well, they should have accepted that because that is what the Bible teaches. Jesus Christ is God. He's one with the Father, and He is part of the Godhead, which is the Trinity. And I don't have a problem using the word Trinity to describe the biblical teaching of the Godhead. One God in three. So, in order to understand this, quickly, let's go to Genesis 1.25. And I don't understand how people can't understand this. Yes, it's something that's hard to get, but it's something we have to accept by faith. And when you understand God and who He is and what He is, and then you understand yourself and who you are and what you are, then it makes sense. Oh, well that totally makes sense. <laughs> now I see how it can be one God in three, because I'm one, and yet I'm three. Okay, let me show you this in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then it goes on there. So in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God is speaking and he says the weirdest thing. He said, let us make men in our image after our likeness. That's a plural. Who speaks like that? When I speak, I say, I'm Robert Breaker, and I'm going to do this, and my, this, and my, and I. That's singular, because I'm one. Yet I'm made up of three, but I'm one. But when God was speaking, he says, let us. He's speaking in a plural, and yet he's one God. Because we just read in Isaiah where he says, I am the one God. There's no other God besides me. So God is speaking, and yet this God of the Old Testament, he is one. And so he's one, but he speaks of himself as though he was in plural. And he says, I made man in my image, in our likeness, in our image, in our... So he's speaking in the plural. How could he say that if he's one? Well, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And if we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 23, we see what we are. And when we see what we are and how we're made... Then we go back to that verse that says we, God made us in, in, in His likeness and His image, and we go, oh, you know, now I get it. You know, the old, I could have had a V8. You know, I, whoa, now I get it. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul tells us, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So me, Robert Breaker, me, this is what I am. I am made up of a spirit, I'm made up of a soul, and I'm made up of a body. I am, consist of three parts, but I am one. I'm one person. I am one human being. I am an individual, but I consist of three. I have this old, stinky, fleshly, sinful body, and then inside of that body, I have my soul that's immortal, that's invisible, that's eternal, that will last forever in one of two places, heaven or hell. And then I have the Spirit. And if I'm saved, well, then I have the Holy Spirit of God within me. If I'm not saved, then I don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, then, then if you're lost, you need to get saved so that you get the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is what happens when you trust the gospel, then the Holy Spirit is sealed inside of you, Ephesians 1.13. Please read. So, I am a triune being. I am one. I am a triune being. So I am one, but I am, consist of three. See how that doesn't make me three different things? I'm not three different Robert Breakers. I am one Robert Breaker, but what makes me up is three parts. All right? God said he made us in his image, so we have three just as he would have three. And when you look at the Bible, it's very clear what those three are. He's three in one. He's the Father. Right, let's put God over here. God consists of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So he is one God that consists of three. Just like I consist of three. But he's, his three in the Bible are called three persons. Now, I'm a person, okay? I'm one person. But in some way, which I can't understand nor explain, God can take his three parts 
and can separate them into three separate manifestations or three separate what he calls persons. And so the Trinity teaching or the doctrine of the Trinity is one God in three persons. And there are people out there on YouTube, some of you probably know who they are, they claim to be King James Bible believers. Um, they go around and they say, the, the teaching of one God in three persons is a heresy, it's a man-made doctrine of, of, of Catholics, and it's wrong. And I look at that and I just shake my head and I say, no sir, you are wrong. If you are teaching against the doctrine of one God in three persons, you are, I don't know what else to say, you are an outright heretic. And I will prove that to you here in a minute. So the teaching of the Trinity is one God in three persons. Now let me show you in the Bible how one God can be one God and still be three separate persons, but yet still be one God. And let me show you in the Bible where it calls God three separate persons. Okay? Let's start out here and let's go to... Um, well, I've missed some verses. I'll come back to these verses because I want to give these to you too. But let's go to Hebrews. Let's start in the book of Hebrews. Does the Bible call God the Father a person? Does the Bible call Jesus Christ a person? Is the Holy Spirit a person in the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't know that and you're teaching against that, then, then you should be reading your Bible and, and not preaching heresy like some people do. Now, I don't like to name names, so I'm not going to. But there's somebody on YouTube that a lot of people that, that used to watch him have contacted me saying, Now, Brother Breaker, I, I saw that guy go off the deep end. He's wrong now. He's not preaching true doctrine, so now I follow you, Brother Breaker. And uh, a lot of times they've sent me emails, and this was the issue. They said, That man is against the Trinity now, and he attacks the deity of Christ by attacking the Trinity. And I say, How sad. And he goes on his little YouTube channel and he says, One God in three persons is a Catholic made-up doctrine and it's not in the Bible. Okay, let's, let's just prove the doctrine right now. All right, this isn't about me versus him. This is, okay, this guy says this, what does the Bible say? All right, if he's right, let's follow him. If the Bible's right, let's follow it. If the Bible's right and he's wrong, then let's say, okay, pray for him. Okay, and that's what we need to do. So in the Bible, I clearly see the term persons describing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. By the way, the Son came in a body. Well, the Holy Ghost is called the Holy Spirit, so that must be the Spirit. So what does that leave the Father? Well, I, maybe some people try to line this up with the body, soul, and spirit. So the Father must be the soul, which is quite interesting because it sounds like in heaven you can't see the Father. It's like he's invisible. But you can see the Son because the Son has a body. In the Holy Spirit you can't see, but you can feel. Well, that's interesting because my body, everybody sees that. But nobody sees my soul. It's invisible. But, but my spirit, well, I'm saved and I feel the Holy Spirit in me. So it's interesting how what we are created as, in the image or likeness of God, we're created with three parts, and He is three parts. But we're not three separate persons. I don't know how God can divide Himself up. I wish I could. There's been many times I'm like, man, I don't feel like going out today. If I could just separate my soul from my body, well, I'd send the old soul out to do it, and I'd stay here in my body. <laughs> or I'd say, hey, Spirit, you go, you go do this, and I, I, but I can't separate. They will separate, though. If I were to die today, my soul would leave my body, and the Holy Spirit inside of me would take me up. If you're lost and you die, when you die, your soul leaves your body, and it goes down to hell. You can look up Genesis 38, 18, I believe it is. And it tells us plainly, clearly, that when you die, your soul leaves your body. This woman, was it Rachel, died? And it says she died, and her soul was in departing. I've showed that verse to many, many Jehovah Witnesses. They say, we don't believe that. There are many things that the Bible teaches that they don't believe because they've been indoctrinated by someone else, by the little Watchtower Society literature, instead of actually reading the Bible. But the Bible says there's a place called hell, and when you die, your soul leaves, and it goes down there. I read Luke 16 of the rich man in hell. So it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, it's still true. Okay? Same thing with the Trinity. You can deny the Trinity all you want. It's still true. There is a Trinity. You say, well, that word's not in the Bible. Okay, don't use that word then. There's still the Godhead, which is one in three. And in the Bible, the Godhead consists of three persons. Three persons. Let me show you that. But yet, one God. Even though it's called three separate persons, it, those three are what makes the one God. Okay, let's explain that to you. Hebrews chapter one, 
in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. What, 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 so Jesus made the worlds? I'm going to show you here in a minute that Jesus is the creator. Well, you go back over there to Isaiah, and it talks about God, Jehovah. He says, I'm the creator. You see, these, these are one God, not two gods. They're just able to manifest themselves in different ways and in different persons. One is the person of the Father, the other is the person of the Son. But it's one God. And it says here, speaking of Jesus Christ, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now who's the his? It's talking about God in the Old Testament. God, Jehovah and the Son of Jehovah. Okay, So the Father must be Jehovah. So it's talking about God the Father in verse 1. And then it's talking about His Son, verse 2, Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 3 that the Son is the brightness of His glory and the express image of the person of God the Father. And I won't continue there. You can read the rest of that all the way down to verse 5. But clearly that verse says, Hebrews 1, 3. Hebrews 1, 3 says that the Father is is a person, and that Jesus Christ is in the image of the person of the Father. It's right there. Deny that, will you? You can't. If you do, you're denying the King James Bible, and you're just exposing yourself as a heretic. If you deny that the King James Bible right there called God the Father a person. It did. It says that Jesus Christ is the express image of His person. Whose person? The person of God the Father. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I just get so sad to see these men that start out right in the ministry, uh, preaching good doctrine and teaching right, and then they fall into false doctrine, and they don't even they don't even care, and they're going around and preaching against sound doctrine. That's so sad, 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 sad. Second Corinthians two ten, Paul is speaking, and look what he says. 2 Corinthians 2.10 To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgave I it. In the person of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.10 What just happened in that verse? What does it say? Paul says, I forgive you in the person of Jesus. So the Bible uses the term person when it's speaking about God. And it says God the Father is a person. And that Jesus is in the image of the person of the Father. Hebrews 1.3. And then it says that the Son is a person. And Paul says, I forgive you in the person of Christ. So he's a person. Now how about the Holy Spirit? How about the Holy Ghost? Is that a person? Well, it's certainly personified in the Scriptures. Let's go to the book of John. I do not see for the life of me how a man can say he's a King James Bible believer and deny the Trinity. I just don't see it. It is a Bible doctrine. One God in three persons. But that doesn't make three separate gods. It's one God in three persons. Means one God who is able to manifest himself in three different ways, but he's still one God. John 14, 16. Uh, John 14, 16, we read these words. Look what it says. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Notice the Comforter has a capital C. That's a personification of the Holy Spirit, and it's given a name. That He may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit is called the He. So the Holy Spirit is obviously a person, and it's a Comforter. And there's more verses there that we could go into. I'll just give them to you, and you can look them up for yourself. But uh, here they are. Uh, verse 26 also. John 14, 16. John 14, 26. John 15, 26. John 16, 7. The Holy Spirit is personified as a comforter with a capital C. So clearly, when a man comes out and says, I believe in the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, one God and three persons, that person is not a heretic, at least not in saying that. Now, they might be wrong in other doctrines. Uh, the Catholic Church is way off in other doctrines. But when they said that, they were right. The Bible teaches a trinity. It teaches that we are a triune being created in the image and likeness of God in three parts. And as God consists of three, we are made of three. But the Bible calls the three that makes up God three persons. 
But we can never believe that's three separate gods because that's not what the Bible says. The Son says, I and my Father are one. He doesn't say, my Father's one and I'm a different one. And there's three of us all together. We're three different people. Or three different gods. He doesn't say that. He says, we're one. We're three persons, but we're one God. So I don't understand people. I do not understand people. And there are more and more so-called King James Bible believers that are turning away from the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's right there in the Bible, and I just showed you. Let me show you some more. Let me show you some more. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. And it's just amazing to me, we can't get into our study of 2 Peter without seeing of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And that is not saying uh, Jehovah and Jesus, and they're two separate gods. It's one and the same. Jesus is the God who is the Savior you got to see that. you got to see that. You've got to understand that. 1 John 5, 7. All right? There are a lot of people out there that are led by demons, I hate to say. But it's got to be true because the Bible says in the last days they'll be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if someone is departing from truth, then it's because a demon has led them away, led them astray. And the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in the Trinity. But it's right there, and I just showed you, one God and three persons is a Bible doctrine. And here's the verses that call each one a person. And yet, it's one God, not three separate gods. At least in the Bible. Now this verse, 1 John 5, 7, is not in, if I remember right, they've completely taken it out, it's not in the Jehovah Witness Bible, because they will not believe it. And many new versions of the Bible either take out the entire verse or part of the verse. Which does not make sense to me. All right, I had three years of Greek in college. I don't like to run to the Greek. Uh, I like the English. I believe the King James translated perfectly, so I just stick with it because it's what the Greek says. New versions, though, I have studied with the Greek text, and new versions are not consistent and not correct. And they don't always follow the Greek text, like I told you here in the beginning. Why would they go with the one manuscript that clearly said God, but someone erased it? over all the others that said God manifest in the flesh. Someone's not an honest person. Many of these new versions of the Bible are not honest in their translating. The new versions of the Bible, they say, well, 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't be in the Bible. And they say the older manuscripts we have don't have it in it, so it probably shouldn't be there. And you say, oh, really? What are those older manuscripts that you have? And they say, well, the Alexandrian line of manuscripts. Oh, Alexandria, that's right, were the Gnostics and the philosophers and, and, and the, the people that didn't believe in the truth were. Oh, those weren't the true Christians. You see, in the early church, there were two different Bible schools, if you will. There was the school of Antioch, which believed every word of God and took a literal uh, understanding of the Bible, a literal interpretation. And then there was the apostate liberal Bible school of Alexandria, Origen, and all those people down there, who didn't believe the Bible. They thought it was allegorical or metaphysical or metaphorical and all this stuff. And so they didn't care about preserving the Bible. Oftentimes they go through and erase stuff that they didn't agree with. And that's what you see. Someone erased God and made it he. Because they didn't think that Jesus Christ was God. Many of the people in Alexandria came from the Gnostics. And so the critical texts are the Gnostic texts. The Alexandrian texts are the critical Catholic Gnostic texts. So they say, well, even though there's over 5,000 you know, New Testament manuscripts of the Texas Receptus. And even though a lot of them have uh, 1 John 5, 7, we don't accept that because the oldest manuscripts don't have it. And so they say, so we don't think 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible. Well, if you take 1 John 5, 7 out of the Greek manuscript, then you have incorrect Greek grammar. It doesn't work to have 1 John 5, 6, 1 John 5, 8. The grammar is not the same. The grammar is only correct when verse 7 is where it should be. Also, there's a man named Dean Burgeon. And Dean Burgeon was very much against Westcott and Hort, who, who are the first to come out with their critical uh, New Testament of the Bible. Um, and uh, what, this guy um, who was against Westcott and Hort, Dean Burgeon, he went back and he found many, 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 many quotes of the church fathers. 100 years, 200 years after Jesus. And you know what he found? He found many, many times 1 John 5, 7 in its entirety was quoted by the church fathers. Now the oldest text that they tell you that they translate new versions from are from 400 to 600 years after Jesus, and their corrupt texts don't have 1 John 5, 7. 
So they say, well, according to the oldest text, it shouldn't be in the Bible. So we, we don't believe it should be there. And you go, uh, excuse me, but does your brain work at all? <laughs> you went to college to be that stupid, didn't you? I mean, can you be that dumb? All right, a hundred years after Jesus, a guy is quoting the Bible, and he quotes 1 John 5, 7. 400 years after Jesus, a guy goes, well, I have a Bible here, and it doesn't have 1 John 5, 7. All right, so what happened? Somebody in between said, I don't like this verse, I'm going to take it out, and they did. But just because they took it out doesn't mean it doesn't belong there. In fact, it doesn't even read right in the Greek language without it. So we have the witness of the early church that 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible, and they're quoting it 102, 100 years after Jesus. Somebody didn't like it, and they said, I'm going to take that out, and they did. Who was that? The Gnostics. Who was that? The liberals. The evil ones who didn't believe in the Trinity. The ones led by demonic spirits, if you will. All right, so 1 John 5, 7, without a doubt, is correct. Now, I, I get heated about this because more and more I'm getting emails from people going, well, Brother Breaker, there's videos all over YouTube, and they say that the King James Bible added things in, and that they added 1 John 5, 7, and it shouldn't be there. You're listening to a deceiver. You're listening to a liar who tells you that information. They have not studied the whole thing out because if you do, you find 100 years, 200 years after Jesus, the early church had Bibles with 1 John 5, 7 in it. And the King James Bible, they, they're not adding something in that was never there. It's in the text because they said, we found that that was in the Bible to begin with. So that is part of the Word of God. They didn't just out of nowhere say, well, let's just add this verse in here and not tell anybody. And that's what they're trying to deceive you into thinking is, oh, the King James Bible is evil. And they just add verses left and right for no reason. No, there's reasons. The King James Bible translators had all the texts, but they had all the quotes of the early church fathers. And they went and they were studious and they actually read. And they said, 1 John 5, 7, well, that's quoted by, you know, this guy and that guy, 100 years after Jesus. Well, somebody took that out of the Bible. we got to make sure that's in there. So 1 John 5, 7 is part of the Word of God. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible on the Trinity or the, the Godhead. And it figures that people would want to debate that verse. It seems like all the verses on the deity of Christ and the Trinity are verses that the devil wants taken out, and so he makes his little groups that are very against that, and then they all run around and say, shouldn't be in the Bible, shouldn't be in the Bible. And and so sad that stupid Christians go, oh, okay, well maybe that shouldn't be in the Bible. And they won't even study it for themselves, they'll just listen to what they have to say. Why don't you study it out? Because you'll find that it's always been there, but some evil person took it out, led by a demonic spirit, which attacks the deity of Christ, which attacks the Trinity. So what, without further ado, what is 1 John 5, 7? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, so there's three. There are three in heaven. But look at what the verse says. And these three are one. Do you see why the devil wants to take that out of your Bible? And if you're using anything other than the King James Bible, sure as the world, part of that verse is missing, if not the whole verse. Do you see why the devil wants to take that out? Because that's the clearest verse in the entire Bible that says our God is one God in three. That's what we call the Trinity. And it's one God. It's one God. It's not three gods. It's one God. But it consists of three. Let me show you another passage, okay? I have to get this because this is one of the most important doctrines of Christianity. Number one, who is Jesus? He's God. Okay? And what is God? He's one God in three. But those three are one. Not three gods, one God. One God. One God. These three are one. Come with me to the book of John, chapter one. Thankfully, they haven't taken this out of the Bible. If you get a new version of the Bible, they're going to be missing a lot of words. And the biggest lie you'll ever hear in your life is this. Well, new versions of the Bible don't affect any doctrine. That's what they continually say. Go to a bookstore and say, I'd like to buy a Bible. Which Bible should I buy? And they'll say, well, the NASB, and oh, we got the NIV. And, the, and you say, well, I've heard that those, those change doctrine. They'll say, oh, no, no doctrine of the Bible has been affected by new versions. They are lying to your face. Because you take out 1 John 5, 7, you're taking out one of the greatest verses in the Bible that, by the way, has always been there because 100 years after Jesus, they're quoting it that proves that the Trinity, or the Godhead, is one God. He consists of three, but those three are one. 
Amen? So John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was who? Was the Word. All right? So the Son is called and known as the Word. By the way, that's a capital W. The Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oh, so you mean Jesus Christ is God? Yeah. Jesus Christ is God. Just like God the Father is God, just like the Holy Ghost is God, and these three are one. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now look what it says in verse 3. All things were made by Him. Who is the Him? The Word. Jesus. So Jesus is the Creator. He created all things. And you read that in, um, I can't remember, but I remember Paul saying it. Was it in Ephesians? Where it says, and created all things by Jesus Christ. Do you know what new versions of the Bible do? They take out the words by Jesus Christ. And so you read that in a new version. It says, God created all things. <laughs> and people are thinking, yeah, Jehovah sure created everything. But you look at it in the King James Bible. And it says, God who created all things by Jesus Christ. You go, yeah, Jesus is the creator because Jesus is God. Yes, new versions of the Bible affect doctrine. I call them watered-down versions of the Bible because they do affect doctrine, and they attack the deity of Christ, and they attack the Trinity, and they attack many other things. They attack the blood of Christ because a lot of new versions of the Bible take out the word blood. Colossians 1.14, whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Unless you have another version, it just says, and who we have forgiveness of sins. Uh, through, it, where's through his blood? Why, why would you take out the blood of Jesus? It's very sad. It's a satanic attack, is the way I view it. And if you don't, help yourself. But I don't see how else you could, could look at it, except that Satan hates the deity of Christ and the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Of course he's going to try to change it in order to set up his own uh, false church and false denominations and cults. So... Jesus Christ is the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word is God. So how can you be with God and be God at the same time unless God is one God in three, and those three are one? And then you look down in verse um, verse 9, that was the true light, that light, which lighteth every man which cometh into the world. And then look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and will be held his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ is the Word. And he is God, but he's with God. He's with the Father. But he himself is God. Because it's one God in three. Now, with all that stated, oh, we didn't get very far today. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I just want you to know, and, and I think it's pretty interesting, the wording of Peter. Of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In his mind, he's not saying of two different gods. In his mind, he's saying of our God, which is Jesus, and who is our Savior, which is Jesus. It's the same. Same God. Acts 13, 23. Jesus is mentioned. And Paul says, Of man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So God the Father raised to Israel the Savior, Jesus Christ. Who, by the way, is God, manifest in the flesh. Let's go to Philippians 3, 20. And it just it saddens me that... You have people out there in the world calling so themselves Christians who are making fun of and ridiculing and attacking what the Bible says about who Christ even is. Some say he's not even God. Others say, no, there's no Trinity. And you just look at that and you go, I, I, what are you saying? Philippians 3.20 says, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> All right, what is he saying? Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. What? Well, is he got two different gods here? Unto God and to our Father. So unto Jesus and to the Father. Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying and unto God and our Father? Because God is and our Father. That's his name. God is the Father. I don't see him saying unto two different gods, to the Father and to another God. It's all one. He, all the early Christians knew that it's one God in three. And they're three separate persons in the sense that they can manifest in three different ways. One is a Father, one is a Son, one is a Spirit. But that doesn't make three gods. The three gods thing is a pagan teaching. And we don't believe in a pagan teaching of three gods. We believe in these three are one. 1 John 5, 7. 1 Timothy 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior. <laughs> But Jesus Christ is God the Savior. So he's, he's saying, uh, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God the Father, who is also the Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. It, it, they're using them interchangeably because they are. Jesus is God. The Father is God. Holy Spirit is God. One God. Not two different gods. 2 Timothy 1.10. I just get saddened that there are people out there that claim to be Bible teachers, and yet they're leading people astray on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, 2 Timothy 1.10. 2 Timothy 1.10 says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So is our Savior? Our Savior is Jesus Christ. But the other verse said, Our God, who is the Savior, and Jesus Christ. It must be Jesus is one with the Father, just as the Holy Ghost is one with the Son, just as the Holy Ghost is one with the Father. It must be that it's one God! in three separate persons, but that doesn't make three gods, that makes one God. One God! One God! One God! I mean, I don't know how to make it any plainer, but I can't tell you how many hours I've argued while out knocking on doors in Honduras and in Mexico and here in America and, and dealing with people who were trained by Jehovah Witnesses and they do not believe in the Trinity of one God in three persons. They say, oh, you have three different gods. And I go, no, my Bible doesn't say three different gods. Where did you get this from? They didn't get it from the Bible. They were taught that from someone who was led astray by a demon. Judge Rutherford. All right, Titus 1.4. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's not two different gods. He's just mentioning two of the Godhead together. And it's one God, but it's able to be manifested in two or three different manifestations or three different persons. Second Peter 1.11. So finally we get back to Second Peter, yeah? Second Peter 1.11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the Lord, and He's the Savior. But the Lord in the Old Testament was Jehovah. And he said, I'm the Savior. Besides me, there's no other. But here Jesus is called the Lord and the Savior. So that must mean that Jesus is one with the Godhead. He is one. He is part of the Trinity. He is one God. And a God consists of the Father, the Son. Do you see that? Do you see that? I hope you do. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18. As a matter of fact, last verse. 2 Peter 3.18. Look what it says. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Okay. Have you grown in grace? You see, these people that are against the Trinity, they have no grace whatsoever. They just run around to try to attack people that believe in the Trinity and put us down and tell us how dumb and ignorant we are because we believe in the Trinity. What an idiot. <laughs> you should hear the way these people talk. And I look at my Bible and I go, uh... 1 John 5, 7 says, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay, so when it says these three are one, I just believe that because the Bible says it. I don't say these three are three different ones. That's not what it says. It says these three are one. And I look at the Bible and I say, and it's one God and three persons because Hebrews 1, 3 says that Jesus is the express image of, of the person of God the Father. And I read 2 Corinthians 2.10, it says the Son in the person of Christ. And I see the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit personified. So I say, my Bible teaches a Trinity doctrine. I am a triune being created in the image of God and His likeness. I have three parts that make me up. God consists of three parts. But the Bible calls those three parts three persons because they're personified as a father, as a son, and as a spirit. And God wants to relay to us this, this idea of a father and son relationship. Because when we get saved, then God is our father, and we're his son. And so there's a lot more to that. But if you believe the Bible, then you will believe in the Trinity. And I do not have a problem using the word Trinity even though that's not a Bible word. That was a made-up word. But it was made up by Christians early in the church age before the Catholic Church. Also, there's another word in the Bible, rapture. And people say, well, the rapture's not in the Bible. Well, the word rapture never appears in the Bible. But the doctrine does. And the word rapture comes from Latin, 
Well, I don't have a problem using the word rapture when the doctrine is there. Just like I don't have a problem using the word trinity when I find the doctrine there. Okay? So there are many things like that. There's a lot of things we call like the tribulation. I use the word the tribulation period. And people get confused because Paul says we shall all go through tribulation. They go, well, what are we going through? No. The tribulation is a period of seven years. But as Christians, we do go through tribulations in the sense that we go through trials. We go through problems. We go through suffering. Okay? So the best thing to do is define terms. And as a Bible-believing Christian, a King James Bible-believing Christian, I believe in the Trinity. And I define the Trinity as one God in three persons. And I define that with the Scripture itself. These three are one. In order to deny that, you have to take out verses out of the Bible. Or you have to twist Scripture. Or just basically ignore it, which is what some of these guys do. They say, oh, that breaker, <laughs> he says one God in three persons. And he says, oh, oh why, why that breaker, fella, he says the Bible calls uh, God uh, three persons. Well, there's the verses. <laughs> so why don't you take down your videos attacking me? Because clearly you're wrong, okay? And get right with God. Well, this all ties into verse 3. So let's go back to uh, 2 Peter and finish this up. I wanted to get down to verse 3. So I guess next time we'll have to start in verse 3. But verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, of them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He's not talking of two different gods right there. It's one of the same. So when he says of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ, he's talking about the one God who is also our Savior, and who is also Jesus Christ. Verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So there is some knowledge that you should have. And that knowledge is the knowledge of God. And so we get into the first uh, couple of verses of 2 Peter, and it's all about, do you know who God is? And it's sad that there's whole denominations out there that claim to be Christian, and they're, they don't even have that knowledge. I hate to use the word. They're stupid. Okay? They're just plain stupid. Stupid. They're, they're ignorant of who God is. He is one God consisting of three. And the Bible says those are three persons. But yet, those aren't three separate gods. It's one God in three. So the knowledge of God, and what does Peter want? He wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he wants us to grow in the knowledge of God and of our, Jesus our Lord. So when we understand that God the Father in the Old Testament, Jehovah, is the same as the Lord of the New Testament, then it makes sense. Oh, because I and my Father are one. It's one God, consisting of three persons. Now, verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So notice, it's knowledge. You've got to have knowledge. Verse 2, Through the knowledge of God, the knowledge of him. Do you know him as your Savior? If you're denying the Trinity, I've got to wonder if you're even saved. I mean, I hate to say that, but you don't even know who God is. So are you even trusting in what God did for you? <laughs> Because right here, what happened? God shed his blood. Boy, I want to keep going. I don't want to stop. <laughs> Let me close with this verse real quick. Go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And guess what? Just another of many verses that new versions change. That's why you need to stick with the King James Bible. Or you're going to fall into error. The King James Bible says in Acts 20, 28... Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now new versions change that to the church of, I don't know how they, what do they say, the church of the Lord or something like that. And there's people out there that say, well Jesus is a Lord but he's not the same Lord as the Old Testament because Jesus isn't God why only Jehovah is and things like that. And so someone changed that verse in new versions. And then you lose this. Look what it says. God, comma, which he hath purchased. Who is he? God. Every time you see a pronoun, you have to look for the antecedent. So it says, which he, which God hath purchased with his own blood. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he purchased the church with his own blood. Who is Jesus? God. 
So God died in my place for my sins. God died for me. So God shed His blood. If it's God's blood, then Jesus is God. And that does not make two different gods in the Bible. It's all part of the Trinity. It's all part of the Godhead, which is one God in three persons. Now, verse 3 there talks about His divine power. His, again, that's speaking of Jesus, so divine power. <laughs> divine. If something is divine, then it's deity. It has to do with God. So all through Peter, he's saying Jesus is God, Jesus is God, Jesus is God. And yet new versions of the Bible attack the deity of Christ in many key verses. So why is that? Because I believe many of the people that translated these new versions are possessed with devils, or else they're lost altogether. And uh, if they are saved, they're what you call apostate Christians. And what does the Bible say? That in the last days, there'll be a falling away. That's the apostasy. That's the falling away. And it's very, very sad to me to see people out on YouTube claim to be Christians, and even claim to be, I'm King James only. And yet they go against the doctrines that they've been taught in Christianity or, or from other Christians or brothers and sisters in Christ. And they begin preaching against things like the Trinity you got to wonder, are they lost and led by devils? Or are they saved, but they just became apostate? They've just fallen away from the truth. Well, either way, they're wrong. We need to pray for them. And with grace, we need to try to reach them. I've tried my best to be graceful. I've tried my best to be nice. I don't want to call names, amen, put people down, attack, and do all that stuff. But I tell you what, when you know God and you know the Bible, you can't remain silent. You have to speak up and speak out. And I just find it amazing going through 2 Peter. And if you just pay careful attention to the words, Peter preached what I preach and what Paul preached. We believe in one God in three persons. But that one God is Jesus Christ, it's the Father, and it's the Holy Ghost. All three are one. All three are God. And I don't see how people can miss that. But they do. All right, next time I guess we'll start. Uh, we, I still have some more to get into in verse 3, so I guess we got through verse 2 today, so thanks for being with me. God bless.